Separated by 5,000 miles, two groups of fighting men are on parade. At the Iwo Jima Memorial in Washington, D.C., the United States Marine Corps performs its silent drill. In the southern suburbs of Beirut, the fighters of Hezbollah, the party of God, honor the martyrs of their war against the West. The Americans were part of a multinational force sent into Beirut in August 1982. What started as a peacekeeping mission ended in disaster. More than 200 US Marines were slaughtered here in their sleep by a Hezbollah suicide bomber. It was the largest loss of life for the Marines since World War II. It took some time to realize that it actually had happened. It's kind of scary to even think that it was so devastating as it was. There was uh, 23 people in my platoon. The only three of the 20 that were actually inside the building made it out. In 1982, Lebanon was in the throes of a bloody civil war that had lasted for seven years. Thousands of Syrian troops had occupied the north of the country. Israel had invaded from the south, and by August, Israeli troops stood on the outskirts of Beirut, encircling thousands of PLO fighters trapped in the city a multinational peacekeeping force, including the Marines, was sent into Beirut to prevent further bloodshed by escorting the PLO out of the country. Days later, the Americans were back on their ships. In the Marines' absence, a shocking massacre took place of 800 Palestinian civilians in the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps. News of the massacre shook the US government. There was bitter disagreement about what to do next. I thought we should not go in, uh, again, not because of the massacre or anything of that kind, but because we didn't have any defined mission. There was a mission. The mission was to help the Lebanese get stability, first in Beirut and then throughout their country, and be able to provide a credible government there. And so you had this most dangerous of all uh, situations. You put your forces in without any kind of mission, without any kind of knowledge of when the matter end, without any specific goal to be achieved, and just to stay there. Uh, and that, uh, I thought, was uh, imposed a terrible risk uh, on our troops. And I argued consistently before and after the decision was made to go in the second time that we shouldn't be there and that we should get out. My difference with the Secretary of Defense was whether we should be there at all, and he didn't want to be there. And I felt that we had an important role to play in Beirut and Lebanon, and uh, I was, the President agreed with me. The President felt we should have an important role, and so it was the President's decision, not my decision, to do the things that we did. One of those who served in Beirut was Jeff Young. He came from a small town in New Jersey where his family had lived for five generations.
We were married in 1960, and we had two sons. Jeff was the firstborn, and he was uh, born in July, and he would have been 33 this July. And uh, I'm sure Jeff would have planned his life around what he would have been able to do after he got out of the service, and it would have been, he would have planned his life, life here. I don't think he really had any thoughts of, of going anywhere else. He was happy here. I didn't have any, any problem with him going to Beirut. He wanted to go. He was looking forward to going. And several of the fellows had assigned themselves for another six months just so they could all go together. The 24th Marine Amphibious Unit arrived in Beirut in late May 1983. They were replacements for other Marines who were going home. That morning, we were looking at the coast. We were just right in front of the boat looking at it. We were on a landing craft. There wasn't many words said. Nod at each other, you know, this is it, you know. <laughs> um, it was like a landing, I mean, a real Marine landing, you know, different than training. And uh, I said, man, this is, you know, I think of my father being in the war and him talking about things and what it was like and my brother. And now I was doing it. And it, it, I had, you know, it was pride, you know, it was like, I'm doing the job I was trained to do. And you'd get the high five from the kids or you'd get thumbs up or, or, or the peace sign and smiles. So I felt very comfortable I felt uh, a privilege being there, being a peacekeeper. The idea was to go out and show the flag, let the public see you. And uh, it, was, it was a good feeling, it was a, a proud feeling, so to speak. You almost felt invincible. You almost felt like the big guy on the block. But the Marines soon learned that the peacekeepers had become targets as well. Sitting in 11, I with nothing to do. Just listen to the RDN, the sniper shots too. Once in a while, when it's really slow, we hear the EOD really let one know. Off in the distance, hear the rifle shots go. So we get in our bunkers and we keep our heads low. We got the Israelis out in front of our line. Just sitting in and waiting for the end of time. The Syrians are staying on top of the hill. Just hanging around for someone to kill Neither one will leave till the other ones do So we're sitting here in Lebanon singing the blues Our mission was peacekeepers. I have never, even to this day, ever been trained as a peacekeeper. I'm a, I was a combat marine. I was a grunt for my whole time in. As a drill instructor now, I, I teach recruits every day to be aggressive. Everything is, is go, 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 attack. Target! T-72 is direct front! Frontal, gun one of my command, gun two an impact! Then we get there and we're sitting there being shot at and we can't do anything about it. You're highly vulnerable because of the mission you're there, uh, that, that you have, a peacekeeping mission, essentially in a place where there really wasn't any peace. Towards the... Uh, End of August, uh, things started getting uh, a little shaky. We were in the impact area. The factional fighting had picked up. Were there any flashes from it, and did they correspond Just with the uh, incoming at uh, Charlie Company's position? It's like one of them pajama things, you know? The atmosphere had, uh, had changed quite a bit, and this feeling of uh, hostility was uh, was increasing. Hey, Petrie! You see him up there? You see him up there? Where? Straight out in front of us. The building with the orange curtain on it. It's to the left of it. Uh, we started uh, taking runs. We started taking casualties. Uh, I was very concerned. We, uh, we took uh, killed in action. We took wounded. And uh, it kept getting progressively uh, progressively worse.
being in uh, in a foxhole or in a bunker, and uh, it was frustrating because you could feel the ground shaking around you. You'd hear the whistling of the uh, the rounds incoming, and uh, there was nothing that you could do about it. And I remember the frequency of running out day and night, just sitting there, no one firing back, taking these rounds, taking these bullets, saying, uh, is this going to increase and become uh, worse? Uh, we just didn't know. And when you don't know, you become more frazzled, more nervous, more frustrated. So the Marines began to recognize this is not a good spot, and the morale took a heavy hit. As the shell fire intensified, more Marines were moved into a large, reinforced concrete building on the perimeter of Beirut International Airport. The battalion landing team headquarters was known as the BLT. Such a heavy concentration of men in one area was contrary to military doctrine. It was a decision criticized later. I had absolutely no choice that I had to bring the Marines that were exposed in tents and in open areas between runways at the airport as much as I could, bring them un into hardened uh, facilities, for better word. And uh, that BLT building that eventually was the target of the bomb uh, to move them in there, I simply had no choice because I had no other place to put them. If you were looking at the building, I was in the front part of the building at the top left corner of the building. 12 to 18 of us slept in that room, but the building had no electricity and no running water. As the mission continued, distrust of the Marines increased among the warring factions. The US forces were supplying and training the largely Christian army of President Amin Jamal, which was at war with Muslim and Druze militias. On September the 19th, American forces became directly involved in the battle to save a key strategic point overlooking Beirut. The village of Sukh el Khab, held by the Lebanese army, was being attacked by Druze fighters. U.S. warships anchored offshore were ordered to fire on Druze positions. I knew the minute we started down that path of providing direct support to the Lebanese army, we, you don't turn back. That's a slippery slope you start going down. The same as responding. And it just was contrary to the mission. And it clearly was a, um, a milestone event on our uh, commitment over there that I felt uh, we, were, we became another militia afterward. Yes, of course, we did welcome them and uh, the French and the Italians, of course, but suddenly their policy changed and they were involved uh, stupidly in the uh, civil war that started. Why the Italians were not involved in the fighting? The Italians were much more clever. Even the French tried to stay away. The Americans, I don't know why, were involved. The Lebanese army was backed at that time by the Americans, and uh, they, were, they had a signature with the Israelis, our enemies. So we had to find somebody to support us. Yes, we were supported by the Syrians and by the Soviet Union, and we were proud of it. I know this whole war was dirty. You know, it shouldn't have started at the first place. But it started, and instead of helping, you know, one fraction against the other, it should have helped, you know, to stop the whole thing. They were shelling Aite. My house was hit. My auntie was killed. The American people were told that they were a peacekeeping force. This was propaganda. We lived through the real story. We paid the price and suffered the consequences. Their actions were contrary to their claims. They were bombarding the people. And if the American people do not believe that, let them bring experts to see the places that were destroyed. We say that the American people are innocent like our people. They surely don't like to hurt the Lebanese people. The attacks on the Marines left a clear message. They were no longer welcome as peacekeepers. And I think they, they basically were trying to, their way of saying, hey, yeah, it's time for you to go. You know, we, leave us alone. We've been fighting for 200, 300, 500 years here. You don't know what you do. You don't belong here. And uh, I think they started just uh, taking these little pot shots and, and testing us. And they did. And they got, awa got away with quite a bit. When we've taken, you know, direct hits here and gotten people hurt, 
there have been some people who have been pretty upset by it, but I think that's always going to be the case on the whole. Condition one occurred almost every day. So they put a couple of our guns up on the roof of the BLT building. I remember one night in particular sitting behind the sandbags and hearing these rounds going. I had wet pants when I, that night, for the first time in my life, I, was, I have never been so scared. I wet my drawers. I was that scared because any one of those rounds could have taken that whole corner of that building out. More and more Marines used to come uh, with various reasons. Uh, they were scared. Their buddies were just wounded. Um, they were thinking about homes now. They were thinking about families, wives, their children. One of those who became increasingly worried was Sergeant David Battle. Two days before the bombing, he was baptized. I truly feel that in his heart he felt unsure. I think that, um, that he felt that, that something was amiss. And I, that, that bothers me to this day, that, that he was unsure about his safety. Not just his safety, the safety of his men. Um, fear is, is terrible when you fear for your life and, and for the life of, of your troops. And he felt like he was responsible for his troops. Back in Washington, D.C., Secretary of Defense Weinberger and the Joint Chiefs of Staff recognized the danger the Marines were in. They argued for them to be pulled back to their ships for safety. I did warn constantly of the dangers of this kind of thing and how, how unwise it was and uh, literally begged each meeting that I attended to get them out of there. Uh, at least, if at, the, at the very least, to put them back on ships and get them off the land uh, in a place where, if anything should develop, we could be reinserted. But uh, uh, to no avail, because it was always argued by those of us who, in our government, who wanted to keep them there, that this would be cutting and running and Marines never retreated and, and various other nonsensical slogans that, uh, uh, that had no meaning in this kind of a situation. The president was worried about cutting and running. That was not a slogan. It's a problem if people see you in the face of opposition, see you cut and run. That's not some slogan. That's a, that is something that hurts you badly. And the fact that in the end, it appeared that that's more or less what we did has hurt us in the Middle East, even to this day. People remember that. In Letters Home, the Marines told about the undeclared war they were fighting. Lance Corporal John Buckmaster wrote frequently to his parents in Vandalia, Ohio. We watched the news because he was there, and uh, the news didn't show anything great going on over there. But from his letters, you could tell that there was action and shooting. Uh, and from what he was saying in the letters did not coincide with what the news was saying. I really didn't worry till we got this letter that we received from John, and it almost read like a last will and testament. Dad and Mom, howdy. Well, as you know, we have had some really intense fighting today, and it hasn't stopped yet. If anything should happen, and I was to be killed, and he goes on to explain what he wanted done with his things. And the most what would get to you the most, what would get to any parents. And it says, also, I have told Sharon, and Sharon was his fiance, he was planning to come home to be married that I want you to have my set, I told Sharon that I want you to have my set of dress blues. Here he's speaking to his father. It's the only thing that I have, which I can show the love and respect I have to, for you. 
a Marine's gift to another Marine, okay? I'm not going to be a hero. I'll be careful. And he always signed his letters. I'll be careful, Dad. I'll keep my head down. He says, I promise. He says, I'm coming home. I love you both very much. Your son, and damn proud of it, John. So, he came home. in a flag-draped coffin. I was a sergeant of the guard the morning of the Beirut bombing. I had a little guard shack, which is like a little ticket booth, located right at the entrance to the lobby of the BLT headquarters building. It was Sunday morning. Uh, birds chirping, you could hear the, the normal everyday Sunday sounds, which were quiet. Sundays was a day of rest for us. Everybody was sleeping. There was no reveille on a Sunday. And then I heard the rev of an engine. It sounded like our six buys, which is our five 10 ton trucks, the whine of a diesel uh, engine sound. I heard that to my rear. And it caused me, it, it got my attention in, su in such a way that it just caused me to kind of turn and I, and I looked over my left shoulder to my rear. And I saw a big yellow, uh, maybe eight, ten ton truck. And the driver had a beard and a mustache, and I can't remember the clothing too well. It might have been camouflage utilities or something. But the driver had a shit eating grin on his face. Just like that, he had a, a smile on his face. And uh, right at that instant, something snapped. I don't know what happened. Something snapped in me, and I just immediately turned and ran directly through the lobby. And as I ran through, I remember yelling two or three times to hit the deck, hit the deck. I screamed it as loud as I could. I sat down at a desk that had my back to the window to, to clean my rifle. Approximately about 6.20, right around 6.22, somewhere in that area. The, uh, I heard Sergeant Russell, who was Sergeant of the Guard that night, shouting down in the, in the inside of the building, since the core of the building was hollow from the roof to the floor. You could hear somebody shouting down there. I knew it was Sergeant Russell. I knew that something was happening. So I began to place my rifle back together, and I was yelling for the people in my team to get up. And I probably got another 30, 35 feet and looked back over my shoulder at the truck again. At this instant that I look back now, the truck, you could see, had had just stopped. It just stopped, settled. The engine was dead. There wasn't a sound, not a movement out of the cab. Everything was dead silent. I could, I, I, to this day, I say I could have heard a, a pin drop in that lobby. It was that quiet at that instant in time. And then within a second, I saw a bright yellow-orange flash at the lower right of the grill. All that truck, a big flame just seemed to just start there. It started right there and just went right up and, and covered the driver's side, just covered the cab, right? And just that quick, I felt heat and a wave of concussion, a powerful slap, and that's all I remember. Then there was a bright orange flash. I never heard anything, and the, the next thing I knew, it was pitch black, and I felt like I was floating through the air. Um, now I begin to see shafts of light, and I, I looked up over my head, and I could see the ground come, rushing toward me, so I tried to turn over, and I landed. I ended up landing on my feet three stories below.
as I turned the corner and looked at the building, I was looking up to look at the building, there was no building. Uh, this four-story structure was uh, leveled. And uh, I remember looking at this, saying this has to be a, a nightmare. Uh, this is unbelievable. Silence, nothing. There were bodies everywhere. There were body parts. I looked up into the, uh, the trees and uh, there were some people and bodies impaled into the tree with the branches going through them. The, uh, there were, there were uh, concrete pillars uh, on top of people. Uh, there was, I remember there was this one corporal that worked in the, uh, the headquarters company and uh, he was a little bit down in the crater and he was yelling for help. I walked over to where he was at and he had this, uh, th this concrete pillar on his lap which was about three feet by three feet and it was about 20 feet long. And uh, you know, he was yelling for help. I, I went over there and uh, tried to move the concrete pillar. I couldn't. So I told him that I'd go back and try and get help. By the time the smoke cleared enough to see, all I could see was a large pile of rubble you could hear voices in the rubble. Uh, I went back to just try to find someone, someone, anybody, help anybody I could. But with the injuries I sustained, I really couldn't dig the way I, it, it would take to, to get people out. I woke up, it was like a dream. I kept saying to myself I had to get my truck and go home. I had to, I kept saying to myself, I had to get up, it was real, it was dark. I said, I got to get my truck and go home, you know. And uh, I opened my eyes and there was a, a Marine who like lifted something off my face. I mean, cause I guess he was right there, you know, pulling something off my face. And I looked at him and I said, what happened? He was, well, I need to get some help. I just started taking my oils out, put the stroll around and I just started doing last rites that anybody could see. And uh, there were people in all kinds of precarious situations. How we found them was a, a great distraught to me, a great uh, emotional uh, distraction to me how these people were caught unawares. And the only thing I could think of was here we are in World War II again in uh, the Battle of Pearl Harbor. Sunday morning, early morning, where people are asleep, no way of defending themselves. Uh, who would do such a thing? Who would do such a thing to peacekeepers? 20 seconds after the attack on the Marines, the barracks of the French paratroopers was also bombed with heavy loss of life. got up to the infirmary, they took me inside, they placed me up against the wall on my cot, tagged me. It was mayhem. The bodies were coming in, in pieces, whole, dead and alive. I remember at one point being there, 
pretty conscious the whole time and, and watching them bring all these different individuals in. And I remember distinctly a, 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 a moan to the, my rear over my head. I heard a cry. It was a very unusual moan that really caught my attention and caused me to, to raise my head and look. And it was a, it was a, uh, it was a black marine with, uh, he had no back. He was laying on his stomach. And all I could see was ribs. He didn't make it, obviously. The death toll of the bombing of the American barracks was 241. The French lost 59 men in the attack on their compound. Dozens of wounded Marines from the bombing were evacuated to US military hospitals in Germany. I woke up again to the prettiest green eyes you ever saw in your life. Uh, it was a nurse, Patty Marks. Um, she, you know, I opened my eyes and her eyes always stick to me today. Uh, she's, a, she's my lifesaver. And she told me that the commandant was there to see me uh, and some other people. And if I felt like talking and I tried to speak, I couldn't. I said, this is General Kelly, the commandant. How are you doing? And of course, he couldn't speak and he couldn't see. And uh, uh, I think he thought that, that I was a, kind of uh, kidding with him. So he, he, he grabbed me. So I, I reached up, grabbed his collar, you know, because I knew, you know, General, you know, commandant is going to have four stars. And I grabbed him and just one, two, three, four. And you know, I knew it was him. He started to motion with his finger. And uh, we weren't quite sure what he wanted to say, but the nurse brought over his chart and put a pencil in his hand. And uh, young Jeff Nashton wrote uh, Semper Fi. Uh, Semper Fi is, a, uh, is an abbreviation for Semper Fidelis, which is uh, our motto in the Marine Corps, which, which is always faithful. He understood what Semper Fi meant. I understood what it meant. And all the Marines knew what it meant. And that's, all, that's who it was for. It was for me to him. The Marines who died in the bombing were flown back to America via Germany. Someone said that uh, there was a C-141 airplane uh, that had landed a short time before and uh, it was loaded with caskets of Marines. Uh, I said, I want to go see it. Uh, I went over and I don't think anybody could ever see a C-141 loaded with 144 caskets and not be moved. It was like somebody hit me over the head with a baseball bat. When the president got the news and thought about it for the moments that we were there together, he was angry and he said, we've got to find who these bastards are and get them. And he meant it. The president directed that we devote a maximum effort with our overhead satellite collection, our eavesdropping, our human collection, and we conducted the most massive search I've ever seen to try to identify any piece of evidence that might help determine just who was it, who had done it. An FBI team of forensic scientists was sent out to Beirut. Deep in the crater of the wreckage of the BLT, they found the axle of a 19-ton Mercedes truck. 
I started along with uh, a survey crew to start measuring distances of glass breakage, deaths where people had been thrown, eardrum breakage, all the, the factors that would go in to try to determine how much explosives that had been used. The first time that we came up with an estimate, I said, no, can't be this much. It's impossible. And the, and the more that, that we worked in, in this regard, the more positive that we were becoming that this was the biggest bomb that we had ever seen. And actually, we had never heard of one ever being this large that had been used, say, outside of, an, of a test or outside of a nuclear weapon. Thurman and his colleagues determined that at least 12,000 pounds of explosive had been used to destroy the marine barracks. US intelligence focused its attention here on the Bakar Valley. It concluded the bombing had been the work of Hezbollah, a previously unknown group of Lebanese Muslim extremists backed by Iran. All of us were quite moved by photographic evidence of a mock-up training site that was analogous in virtually every respect to the site actually hit. And this mock-up site in the Bekka Valley uh, involving a road, a turnoff, a building structure, uh, gave us very high confidence that that was that had been the rehearsal area for the conduct of the attack. In Hezbollah's strongholds in Lebanon, it honors the martyrs of its jihad, or holy war. Its leaders hold the West responsible for the years of bloodshed in their country. But Hezbollah has never admitted responsibility for the bombings. والأمريكيون حينما جاءوا عام 82 مع الغزو الإسرائيلي للبنان. In 1982, the Americans accompanied the Israeli invasion with the hope of achieving their long-term aim to gain power in Lebanon. The Israeli invasion was part of this project, and the political trend to support the Americans at that time contributed toward this scheme. All those who stood against the Israeli invasion and against the presence of the multinational forces were aiming to destroy the American ploy. So the Americans were not purveyors of peace in Lebanon. They were behind all the strife and destruction. They were the real murderers of the Lebanese people. And they were the ones behind the conflict that lasted more than 17 years in Lebanon. The people of Lebanon have the right to confront this new colonial power and challenge it, and to wage war against it. The blowing up of the Marines' headquarters and other actions are manifestations of such a war. Most Lebanese people do not support the extremist aims of Hezbollah, but neither did they see the Americans as peacekeepers. The bombardment by U.S. warships, which had begun more than a month before the bombing of the BLT, increased in intensity afterwards. In February 1984, a small village called Tibet was bombarded by more than a hundred shells from the World War II battleship New Jersey. The New Jersey, one ton and a quarter, the weight of their, that's what I hear. Why? What did we do? What did they gain? They only harmed us. One person was killed. 28 persons were badly wounded. So why? When we got some heavy, heavy shells, heavy bombs from New Jersey, I don't know how, what kind of rules of engagement you, you, are, you are speaking about. I don't know. 
Why did their sons die in Lebanon? Why did uh, so many sons, American sons, died in Vietnam, now maybe in Somalia? I don't know what, what. They have to ask their government, their president, their advisors. We are really sorry for their sons, but also they have to think about our sons. Thousands of us died. I felt and still feel uh, these absurdities that uh, this uh, small American presence uh, part of a multinational presence that was equally uh, small and, and basically uh, uh, not sized or armed uh, for the tasks uh, that, that might be required to ensure their survival uh, were being kept in these very dangerous places. Uh, so yes, you get a mounting sense of uh, frustration and, and ultimately when the, when the expected happens, there's a sense of horror that uh, stays with you, uh, I, I suppose, permanently. A memorial service for the dead servicemen was held at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, home of the Marines. It was just a uh, tragic thing. The president was immediately determined, however, that we were not going to be deterred from our mission in Lebanon by this terrorist attack as we viewed it. And uh, while, once again, there was a lot of objection from the Pentagon, um, the, pre the president was immediately saying, no, we're not going to be run out of there. And we redeployed Marines and defended them adequately, and they stayed for another um, three or four months. Today, 10 years on, Esther and Ali Buckmaster still mourn the death of their son, John. They regularly travel from their home in Ohio to North Carolina to visit the Beirut Memorial. If you talk to someone and, and talk about, you know, my son being killed in Beirut, they don't remember Beirut. And a lot of people don't remember the bombing. That memorial is just beautiful. It's, uh, uh, they couldn't have done a better job. It's just beautiful. It, it does bring comfort. It's, uh, the knowledge that that memorial is there and uh, that he won't be forgotten. You say, why did this happen? Who did this? It's not going to bring my son back. John's one of, what, 240-some names. I'll meet them someday, and I'll be with John again someday. I haven't been for years. I haven't been for five years or so now. Since the day that they dedicated the statue at the memorial. It tears me apart to, to look at the names and to, to feel the wall, and to, to want to sit there and talk to him. I'd, uh, I think I'd just like to join them. I, I just, I wish I could see him again. We had some good, we had some good times. We had some bad times. But we were close. We were a team. And it's hard to lose 
just that quick. It's hard. It's hard to lose them just that quick. I wish they were here. Stand alone Or with somebody else Or stand with all of us Together If you can believe in something Bigger than yourself You can follow the flag Forever They say it's just a dream, a dreamer's dream, that it's an empty thing that really has no meaning. They say it's all a lie, but it's not a lie. I'm gonna follow the flag till I die. Into every life. A little rain must fall, but it's not gonna rain forever. You can rise above, you can rise above it all. We will follow the flag together. We will follow the flag forever. 